Normally I like to continue my videos right where the previous video left off, but I'm going to interrupt the document that I was in, part 070 underscore loops, for a different document, morepractice.m. As always, a link to this document will be provided in the video description. All of the code I'm going to show you in this video works exactly the same in Octave as it does here in MATLAB. This is basically my best attempt to demystify loops and show you what is happening when you use a loop. So our first example, we're going to generate a vector containing values that take the form n plus 1 divided by n squared. For example, if n starts at 1, our first six values are going to be these fractions or these ratios. I don't know if I really need to cite my source. I mean, this is just like an example problem that I got from this calculus webpage on sequences, but uh, that's where I got this example because I wasn't feeling creative, so I just looked it up. There's no MATLAB code here. It's just a, a calculus lesson. But you can access that link uh, through this document. Again, link in the description. All right, so the very first thing is, what is the best way to generate this sequence in MATLAB? And the best way to do it is the vectorized way. Now, what does that mean? All that means is, we are going to use the built-in MATLAB functions that operate on vectors. Here is the formula for that sequence that I want. I'm going to set n equal to a vector of values 1 through 6, and if I just then set a new variable equal to n plus 1 dot slash, the element-wise division, of n dot caret squared, so using the dot operator again, I'll get my sequence. And there it is. Note that I am using format rat here to jump into the ratio format, but then at the end of the code, I'm going to jump back into the format that I typically like to use, just so I don't confuse myself if I hop between sections. And that works perfectly, and that is definitely the most efficient way that I know how to do this in MATLAB. However, you still need to understand loops and be able to write this code with a for loop, whether that's because not everything is vectorized in MATLAB, or because it's just a handy thing to learn, uh, and this, you'll be able to translate this over to other programming languages that don't have as many vectored operations. All right, here's possibly the worst way to determine this sequence. It's to write it out in what I'm going to call expanded form. And it's only a bad way to do it just because it's very tedious. Now you will see that I actually generate the exact same results, so it is equivalent. The benefit of this, though, is that you can look for patterns. And one of the patterns that I want you to pay attention to is where do you see values that are just counting upwards? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. In fact, everything else about these lines is literally just copied and pasted. That tells us where our loop control variable should be placed in the calculation when we're trying to do this with a loop. Scrolling on down, so here's, here's that looped version. And if I can fit both of them on the screen, or at least enough of them on the screen, you can see that this calculation right here has the variable n in place of where the expanded form has just the numbers counting upwards, in the columns where the number is counting upwards. So this is the looped version. I loop for n equals 1 to 6. The loop is going to repeat 6 times. The first time it repeats, the value of n will be 1. Second time it will be 2, then 3, and then 4. And so I'll put into a new variable named vector at first position 1, the calculation where n is 1. And then I'll put into the vector at position 2 the value calculated when n is 2, and so on. And I don't know if I ran that, but I'll run it here, and we get the exact same thing. It's totally equivalent. All right, another example. So this is a converging series that I, again, pulled off of one of those uh, tutorial.math.lamar.edu web pages, convergence of series, so go check that out if you're interested. And our goal is to write a function that sums up the terms of the following sequence, this sequence here, for k values from 2 through n. Now, I'm not going to write a function. I'm just going to write the code that does it, but you could toss this into a function relatively easily. All right, and first we'll show the looped version of it. So I just decided that my sequence is going to go up to an n value of 10. I'm summing up values, so I need another variable to hold that sum, the total that I'm going to add together. And then I'll say, for k, starting at 2, up through n, the total equals the previous total plus the next value in the sequence. In this case, 1 over k squared minus 1, and k is going to change on each iteration of the loop because that is what the for loop does. So let's see what we get. All right, we get 0 0.65 and then four fives repeating. And if I take n up to 100 and run it again, 
I get 0.74, and if I take n up to 10,000, I get 0.7499. I believe the sequence converges, or the series converges to uh, 0.75. I want to use the proper terminology here. I believe the sum of the sequence converges to uh, a three quarters, 0.75. All right, so that's how it looks with a for loop, continuing on down. And here's how it would look vectorized. It's a lot easier. I mean, this part's exactly the same, and I really could sort of consolidate this into one line right here if I wanted, but I wanted to spread it out a little bit so it doesn't look too confusing. n goes up to 10. k is a vector from 2 through n. I do need to use the dot slash and dot caret operators because I'm operating on a vector. I don't need to use those dot operators in this formula in the for loop because at any given point in the loop, at any given iteration of the loop, k is only equal to a scalar value, a single number, not a vector. Now, it wouldn't hurt to use the dot operators, but it's just not necessary. And I just use the sum function to do the sum of all the values in the sequence. And if I run this, I get that 0.654545. And if I take it up to 10,000 straight away, I get the, oh, sorry, that's 1,000. If I take it up to 10,000, I get the 0.7499, just the same as before. And here's what it would look like expanded, written all out. And again, pay attention to the pattern. What changes from line to line as we go down here? The only thing that changes is this column right here. And so that's where our loop control variable goes. Now, it's not like a guarantee that that's always where your loop control variable is inserted into the calculation, but it's a pretty good bet. And so scrolling back up to our for loop, you know, paying attention to that column, that is, in fact, right where the loop control variable is inserted in our calculation. Continuing on down. Now suppose, with that same sequence and the same sum, that I want to loop until the difference between subsequent sums is less than 0.001. So when I've got a sum, but then I add one more term, when the difference between those is less than 0.001, I want to stop. Now, since I don't know ahead of time without calculating how many times that needs to repeat, without literally just doing the calculation, I need to use a while loop. While loops are appropriate when we don't know how many times we want to repeat. With a for loop, you kind of have to know how many times you're going to repeat because you need to set some variable equal to a vector, and the number of columns in that vector or matrix determines how many times it's going to repeat. So we could just ask for the width of this vector right off the bat, and know how many times the loop's going to repeat. But if we don't know, well then we might need to use a while loop, as is the case here. Now, this code looks a lot more complicated, but a lot of the complexity is just coming from the fact that I have to do two sets of calculations ahead of time, because I need to take the difference between those and see if that difference is bigger than or smaller than my margin right here. So I start k off at 2, same as I did before, calculate the first term in the sequence, increase k by 1, calculate the sum of the first two terms in the sequence. I've got a count variable here because I want to know how many terms I've summed together, although I realize now that this is actually inaccurate because I forgot to count these first two. So I believe, to be accurate, this should start at 2 rather than 0. And then, while the difference, the absolute value of the difference between those two terms is bigger than the margin, while it's too big, keep repeating. Another way of phrasing this is, until the difference is less than or equal to the margin, keep repeating. Note that when I say until, I have to sort of negate or reverse this sign here. And inside the loop, I set total equal to the total next, and then I calculate the new total next beyond that, so I'm ready for the next comparison, after increasing k by 1, and I also increase the count by 1. Now when I was writing this code, I wrote in some tests, just some display statements to display out some information, so that I could verify that things seem to be progressing in the right direction. I strongly encourage you to develop those sorts of habits, and there's no even real reason to delete them unless they really confuse the reading of the code. You can just comment them out. All right, I'll run this section, Control Enter, and we see that the difference is less than that 0 .001 uh, between these two values, between these two sums, and the loop repeated 31 times to get there. And we could change the margin of error if we wanted, or I don't know if the margin of error is the accurate phrasing, but we could change this, make it smaller, and now the loop is going to have to repeat more times. And we can see it's closing in on that 0.75 there. All right, scrolling down, we're continuing with this same sequence, the same sum of a sequence, and now things are going to get even a little bit more complicated. 
This time, instead of just having those two variables, the total and the total next, I'm also going to just remember all of the values that I've summed up, and I'm going to put them into a new vector. I've named that vector vect because I didn't feel very inventive. So this code here does pretty much the exact same thing as the previous code, it just remembers more of the values. My margin's the same, start k at 2, and then the vect at position k minus 1 gets that first term in the sequence, k goes up by 1, the vect at k minus 1, which is now a different position, because k has changed, this is now a different position in the vector, gets the second term, the second sum in the sequence, the sum of the first two values. We do a comparison between the two most recent values, which we can calculate as k minus 1 and k minus 2, see if they're bigger than the margin, and then increase k, and then put the next term into the sequence at k minus 1, which will again be a different position than any of the previous k minus 1s because k is a different value. Let's run it once here. All right, so to get that margin of error, I uh, ran 30 times here. I think that's because I messed up my count. Actually, where is my count? Oh, I based it off of k itself, and I think I messed up my k slightly. Yeah, I should subtract, or I guess I should add one. Anyway, I based it off of k instead of having a separate count, so I calculated that slightly incorrectly. But no worries, don't worry about that too much. All right, so there's my output, and I really want to emphasize the indexing here which is very important to understand. I didn't have to put k minus 1 here. I could have just put 1. I could have just put 2 right here. And it works the exact same way. Here, I'll clear it off, and, and you'll see it's the exact same result. All right, exactly the same result as before. And you can see the 30 right there. So why didn't I just do that? Isn't that easier to read? Well, yes, but I was striving for consistency. You will find that I will only ever put values into vect at position k minus 1, and I'm relying on the fact that k is changing before each of those subsequent calls, each of those subsequent insertions into the vect vector. And why do I subtract 1 at all? Well, because I want to put my first value in at position 1, and k starts at 2. So 2 minus 1 will be 1. And another thing that's valuable about this is besides just printing out those last two values, which by the way I'm doing with end minus 1 and end, which is kind of handy. I could have used end minus 1 and end uh, or vice versa here as well. But the other thing that I can do is I can just simply toss uh, vect into a plot command and I can see what does the sum look like as the, as the sum progresses. And we can see it. Yeah, this might look like it's closing in on 0 0.75. And if I make the margin a lot smaller, probably that graph will get a lot closer to 0 0.75. And yes, in fact, it, it really looks like it's converging at that three quarters right there. All right, continuing on down. And that's really the end of my examples here. I've already posted this document online. I'm going to leave it as it is with, you know, its minor flaws and all. Um, mostly these notes at the bottom are just notes to myself of further examples I could do, but I feel like I've exhausted uh, most of what I can say about this. But anyway, here's a link to that page. Um, I thought about doing this sequence and didn't, so that doesn't mean anything to you. I should probably just delete this stuff. And then it's just some more code uh, that I grabbed for some reason and then never used. So anyway, don't pay any attention to that. That's the end of this video. The very next video will be back in part 070 loops, and it will be picking up right where we left off in the previous video.